The 70th International Astronautical Congress has always been a venue to bring together people from all over the world to share and learn all about the latest in space exploration. This year we meet in Washington, D.C., home to NASA headquarters. IAC TV starts right now. Hello and welcome to day three of IAC TV. I'm Sonia Gavankar, ready to bring you everything you need to know from this year's World Congress. First though, let's take a sneak peek into next year's Global Space Exploration Conference, taking place in St. Petersburg, Russia. I'm now joined by Sergei Krikalev and Chris Selleberger. Thanks so much for joining me. Easy question, what is GLEX? Well, the uh, Global Space Exploration Conference uh, will be happening at this coming June in St. Petersburg. It's the, the third of a sequence of global exploration conferences that happen every three or four years. And it brings together the, really everybody with an interest in exploration, from leaders of space agencies to captains of industry to academics researching in the area of space exploration and brings them all together for a few days to exchange ideas, to develop new concepts, to collaborate together and move the space exploration world forward. And, and actually what I would add, I uh, completely agree with you, and uh, what I would add that this forum is organized by International Astronautical uh, Federation, uh, the same way as this big forum organized. So uh, that's uh, basically continuation of this line of uh, space forums when uh, specialists, scientists, uh, people who are just interested in space uh, is able to come together and uh, share their opinions, their experience. And this forum will, ha as you said, will happen next June in St. Petersburg, what is also kind of unusual because last time I have uh, made a conference uh, in, in Soviet Union at that time, it was in 1973 in Baku. So after a long break, we are going back to, to Russia and uh, in one of the nicest cities uh, going to do this conference. And actually this uh, conference already uh, open uh, call for paper. So now everyone who is willing to join this conference can send their proposal for paper. And we actually both are working on a, a committee that is going to select uh, look through paper and select them for, for future conference. So we expect that it's going to be very exciting. What kind of impact do you hope that GLEX will make in the space industry? Uh, well, in particular the space exploration uh, industry. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're in a very interesting time internationally in space exploration. There's a, a lot of new developments over the last couple of years, even the last few months. And so it's a very interesting time to bring together that global space exploration community. And uh, I think if we look at the impact from past conferences, this one will have a substantial impact as well on the community as we, as we uh, develop plans to work together on new missions and new opportunities. Um, and also my opinion that it will make impact not only on industry, it's also going to have impact on uh, scientific community because every time we move somewhere forward, we work together with scientists, with, with people who, uh, on one hand, provide uh, capability to move forward. On the other hand, uh, when we move forward, they use this opportunity to have new data, new study, new science. Actually, St. Petersburg is an interesting city from this point of view because uh, it's not only a cultural capital of, of Russia, as we said, but it's also have some uh, uh, rocket history behind that. Right in the middle of the city, in uh, Peter and Paul Cathedral uh, Fortress, uh, we have uh, old lab which started their tests with uh, rocket propulsion uh, back in uh, 1920s. So it was very, very beginning of uh, rocket engineering and it has pretty interesting history, so I, I think this conference is going to be interesting from many points of view. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. 
Today's dynamic space industrial community is seeing the interplay between large, long-established corporations that had their origins since the beginning of spacefaring activity and a new generation of startups that are pushing the boundaries of space exploration beyond those traditionally sponsored by governments. Let's take a closer look at what the workforce globally should and hopefully will look like in the future. So the current space workforce is such a group of passionate young professionals and students that really see their career as passion driven. I mean space is fascinating. How can you not be fascinated by, you know, space, the moon, space exploration, how someday we'll return to Mars. So the global space workforce of the future is really passionate and really see passion as a drives for their career. They also see the possibility of making an impact. We are millennials, we want to change the world. And so when we think about this, we want to have the possibility to make an impact in our career. We want to make change, positive change. So to me, the space workforce of uh, tomorrow is very motivated and they come not only from uh, countries where space already exists, but also from non-spacefaring nations, because no matter where they come from or what is their background, space will still be fascinating to them and will still be inspiring to them. I think some challenges facing the space industry comes first in the recruitment. It's very challenging for organizations or for space agencies to recruit young talent, not only because there's not enough people who look for jobs in space, not at all, there are a lot of people who look for jobs in space, but how do you identify those talents that will meet your expectations and that will be a young professionals who can you know, have an impact on your strategy, shape the tomorrow's policy for space, like really have the skills and the necessary knowledge about space on the technical side, also on other fields, because it's very important to have a bit of everyone in space. No matter if you're you know, an engineer, a policy maker, we need that diversity. We need that diversity in the industry, so this is valuable for the young professionals. Don't think it's because you're a non-engineer that you cannot succeed. It's valuable for the educators, like when you educate you know, students, like continue telling them, like, keep the motivation because there is a space for everyone to get involved and for the employers to be a bit you know, sensitized on these matters and say, you know, we have to put this effort to when we recruit young people, like put this diversity. It's, diversity is not just going to come like this. It, it's something that you need to foster when you do your recruitment. Many organizations and universities are setting the standard to what the future will look like in space exploration. Let's take an in-depth look at a few leading the way. STAR, the Center for Satellite Applications and Research, is the organization within NOAA that's charged with bringing the power of environmental observing satellites to NOAA's missions. NOAA's mission is to provide science, service, and stewardship. First and foremost is to protect life, property, and uh, economic vitality. So STAR is critical and essential to NOAA's mission because it brings the satellite expertise necessary to translate raw observations into useful information. How that's used is, for example, in uh, forecast models, the vast majority of data that's used to initialize them is satellite data, so they have to have very high quality data in order to be able to work uh, successfully. I tend to class STARS users into four categories. First is the models, second is operational users that need uh, data and information for situational awareness downstream value-added product providers that will take satellite-based data and combine it with other things to make a new information product, and then finally research users which are developing new environmental understanding and capabilities for use by operational agencies. So STAR serves as a model on how to effectively transition new science from new instruments into operational applications that benefit all aspects of society. The Geostationary Lightning Mapper is the first instrument of its kind which launched two years ago. Uh, it's providing continuous total lightning observations over a near hemispheric field of view. So we can observe the total lightning, the intracloud and cloud to ground lightning all the way from the west coast of Africa to New Zealand. So the GLM allows forecasters to track embedded convection. 
It allows them to identify storm mode and how that evolves with time. They are able to gain insights on whether storms are strengthening and weakening, and they're also able to characterize the storms as they transition offshore. Satellite altimetry is a measure of the height of a water surface, such as the ocean or a lake or a river, that's made from a satellite. The ocean is not like a bathtub. It's not a, just a big blob of uniform water. It has cold spots and warm spots. It has strong currents, like rivers moving through part of it. And altimetry is really the only instrument that gives you, um, in essence, a, a snapshot of that. The information that we make could be used by a fisherman wanting to know if it's an appropriate time to go out and look for the type of fish he wants. It could be used by someone running an aquaculture farm wanting to know if harmful conditions are about to occur in the ocean just, just outside of their farm. It could be used by someone trying to monitor a remote lake or river. Is that river drying up? Or alternatively, is it about to flood and wipe away some village? Environmental satellites uh, feed into numerical weather prediction models. Uh, we call this discipline of satellite meteorology. You use satellite observations of ocean, land, and atmospheres to feed into numerical weather prediction models to provide both short-term as well as a seasonal or long-term long forecast of the environment. There are three different types of uh, products that study a variety of parameters for global change research. Uh, one of the most widely used is the sea surface temperature. Uh, the sea surface temperature record goes back up to early 80s till now. We also have temperature and moisture uh, soundings or profiles of the atmosphere from our polar satellites that goes back to the late 70s as well. Um, then the third type of data set covers land. We use a lot of uh, vegetation indices which are used to study global uh, vegetation dynamics which are related to aspects such as global food security, food production, net primary production, uh, disturbances in land use and land cover, uh, both for due to the anthropogenic as well as non-anthropogenic factors such as fires, uh, deforestation, etc. The big data challenge, as we commonly call it, is already here. We have a lot more observations from satellite than we can handle, and that's why STAR is looking at new alternatives at how to handle those data, including artificial intelligence, numerical approaches like machine learning, and so on. AI is a transformational technique that we have been exploiting for a couple of years now, and it has been demonstrated to add efficiency and improvement in forecast skills. So we used it for calibration, we used it for transformation of raw data into geophysical data, and we used it also hand in hand with the weather forecasting systems to help in those skills. There will always be a big need for satellite observations and it will grow over time because of the unique characteristics of those and the demands of our users. So STAR will continue to do what it has traditionally done, which is bring the satellite expertise to NOAA's mission. The vision is to move to basically a digital twin of the Earth's environment. Uh, which the users can draw from, which we can draw from to create uh, the time critical products that they need for their operations. Fifty years ago, when I was eight, humans reached the moon for the first time. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Those words of that astronaut captivated me. Space has been my passion ever since. I once camped out with a friend to see a comet. The night sky was too cloudy, but we spent the evening gazing at it and talking about stars. In high school, I got hooked on a space opera. Many episodes later, it's still going strong. Space stations, lunar and Mars exploration, black holes, things that were once only fantasy are now becoming reality. Human beings have been looking up at the heavens and weaving stories about them since ancient times. 
Soon, people will be able to vacation on the moon. Gazing at the moon has been a Japanese custom for centuries. Fifty years from now, people might be sitting on the moon, sipping coffee and gazing at Earth. The future has already begun. Toward the moon. Toward space. Toward the future. Take the next step with us. IHI Aerospace. The Epsilon Launch Vehicle is a small solid propellant rocket, which IHI Aerospace mainly designed and manufactured. The purpose of developing this rocket is to lower the barrier of entering to space industry by offering lower cost and more launch opportunities. And since September 2013, our series of Epsilon Launch Vehicle has been successfully launched four times in a row. And now, from 2019, we have begun to offer ride shares by the Epsilon Launch Vehicle, which carries CubeSats and from 40 to 200 kilograms of satellites. We face difficulties of adjusting interfaces of multiple satellites. However, our motto is to treat every single satellite as the main payloads, no matter their size. Not only supporting launching the rocket, we also contribute on the ISS missions, including Japanese experiment modules and HTV spacecraft uh, with our space utilization technologies. These are technologies we have developed through HTV program. We are now developing enhanced systems of propulsions, mechanicals, and structures for HTVX program, which aims to deliver the cargo to lunar orbit. Also, we are actively developing technologies for lunar and Mars exploration, and we will continue to contribute expanding space utilization in cooperation with space agencies and companies around the globe. In 50 years from now, I believe that space will be where we can easily access and we will be a part of everyone's life. As we buy things from different countries by just tapping smartphones, there will be a time when we could do exactly the same things, except we buy things from Mars while living on the moon. Uh, I think the next 50 years will be an era when the science fiction come true, such as establishment of economic zone on the moon and a trip to Mars will be realized and the range of human activities will be expanded. My dream is to make it easy for everyone to go to space. I wish that we can make it happen together. Fifty years later, I believe that territory of human beings will expand beyond the Earth to the moon and to Mars and various communities will be made there. Uh, human beings and payload will be coming back and forth between the Earth and the space frequently. Therefore, the technology of manned space should be more vital to our lives. I believe that a huge communication network will be built in our solar system. Many spacecraft would help connecting everyone and make wonderful discoveries which are hidden in space. And of course, they will keep watching our beautiful Earth. We will make a great contribution to your business in space, and our space technology will give hope to our children. What we transfer by the Epsilon launch vehicle and spacecraft are not just satellites and cargoes, but also carry dreams, futures, and hopes of human beings. Our mission is to make those happen and we are here to support your project and achievement with our technologies and ambitions. NUSIR is a global investment fund and we believe that we are one of the most prominent and active investors in space technology. NUSphere is the primary investor in Firefly Aerospace. 
To date, we've invested a little over $95 million in Firefly. Through its various space investments, Newsphere saw a strong market need for a small and medium launch provider. Having looked broadly at the market, we determined that Firefly Aerospace had the right team, the right technology, and fundamentally the right payload class to deliver on the market needs. So, I mean, if you see on our logo type called Newsphere, right? Newsphere actually been invented by Vernadsky, it's Ukrainian scientist who lived 120 years ago in the Ukraine, who believes that it's like geosphere, biosphere, so it's like different spheres around the Earth. And the top one is Newsphere. No, nous or N O U S or N O O S, depending on Latin or Greek language, it means knowledge. So it's uh, knowledge about basically a knowledge as an envelope exists around the earth. That's how we all get connected, that's how, how passions get together, how brains get together around to solve out the problem of the earth. So we're still in the development phase at Firefly. Um, we uh, remain on track to launch in February 2020. Um, and so the majority of our technical progress has been leading and building up to this. We've completed full qualification of our upper stage and beginning within the next couple of weeks, we're going to be working on full qualification for our first stage. From a business perspective, we're incredibly proud of all the partners and customers who've elected to, to fly with Firefly. Firefly is not just a launch company, we actually operate spacecraft as well. And so, for example, we're looking forward to partnering with NASA in its return to the moon in as early as 2021. Firefly is a new space company, and what that means is we're trying to dramatically lower the cost of entry to space. Uh, we are focusing on the small satellite industry, so we're trying to provide a solution for small to medium launch. We've been in, working on this for about the last five years, and we're just about to launch in the next six months and we'll begin regular service in 2020 for both commercial and government customers. At Firefly, we're developing a new space company to build and operate a new launch vehicle to dominate the small to medium launch class market, as well as in-space capabilities uh, for uh, small to medium uh, lunar landers and orbital transfer vehicles. To get to space, you really have to develop not only the technical capabilities, but an amazing team to integrate together in a cohesive way to build the launch vehicle, uh, the launch site, the test site, uh, do all the technical regulations and really build an operational flow. At Firefly we really want to come out of the gate uh, ready to launch on a steady cadence, uh, building a successful business right from the start. 90% of the Alpha rocket is made out of carbon fiber. There are a lot of different materials we could have chosen to build the airframe out of, but to us composites seemed like the obvious choice. Carbon fiber has the highest strength to weight ratio and so when comparing and looking at metallics, yes, they are really strong in three different directions, but we don't need strength in all directions. So laying up the carbon fiber for us means that we can put extra strength where we need it, and then we don't have to lay up flies in places where we don't need that strength. Carbon composites lend themselves incredibly well to robotic manufacturing. Once we're beyond the development stage for Alpha, we'll migrate nearly all our composite manufacturing to auto fiber placement. AFP will enable Firefly to manufacture an entire Alpha airframe start to finish in as few as nine days. As part of Firefly's five-year plan to expand into spacecraft, there's an opportunity called NASA CLIPS, which is NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Services. And Firefly intends to field a small lunar lander to take cargo to the moon for NASA. Now, we're not starting from scratch. Fortunately, we have a partner in IAI, which is an Israeli company that has demonstrated a lander called Genesis. Firefly is taking that lander and improving it and putting American built components into it as a stepping stone for us to get into building spacecraft. The lunar lander is, is a, a great addition to Firefly. We, are, we started off as a launch vehicle company and the lunar lander really expands our scope and leverages what we do well, but also aligns us with a teammate that's already done this before. So we're the, we're the one competitor out there that is, uh, is teamed with a company that has gotten all the way to lunar orbit, and so we're gonna do it again, but we're gonna build it here in the US. Firefly is a new space company, which means we're trying to change the paradigm. It also means we're trying to draw more people into the industry and into space access. New Sphere has a mission that's very parallel to Firefly's mission. They're our primary investor, and in the future, 
We think that not only building hardware will be a collaboration between us, but also education and STEM will be something that we'll focus on with NewSphere. I think that most humans have a natural desire to understand the things that they can see around them. Um, you know, and for a lot of us, it's looking up into space, and the way to understand that is for us to get there. So it's really exciting to be working at a company that builds launch vehicles and in-space services because I get to see an opportunity to see the power and the ingenuity that goes into a system built by man that can lift off into outer space. In the near term, the most fundamental challenge that I'm looking forward to overcoming is getting to space. We're on track to be flying in Q1 next year, and I look forward to that day when we're all standing at Vandenberg watching Alpha fly to, uh, to space. Beyond that, an important transitional uh, element for Firefly next year is the shift from development stage to a rinse and repeat manufacturing phase. And so we're looking to fly five missions in total next year and scaling up to at least 10 missions in 2021. And that is going to require a different set of skills um, and, and a real maturing of the company. And that is the, the challenge that we're looking forward to making. Eager to see how young people's ideas can influence the future of space policy and exploration? Let's hear from the organizers of the Space for Youth competition on how space can help sustainable development. The focus of our keynote is for the young people, engagement of the young people. So we want to amplify the voice from them and we want to engage them as many as possible. Last year, Secretary General of the United Nations launched the Youth 2030 strategy to engage more young people and to amplify their voices. So the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs also followed that strategy and we launched the competition in collaboration with Space Generation Advisory Council in February this year called Space for Youth. For the competition from the age between 18 to 35, 146 people applied from 46 countries based on the question asking them how can space contribute to sustainable development goals, SDGs. So each applicant to pick up one SDG to describe how can space contribute to their selected SDG. For our first, first round, we asked them to submit three minutes video and in the next round, who were selected, they submitted the paper, actual paper. And then finally, we have three winners to the ISC this afternoon presenting their ideas on the SDGs, having the mentors from the space leaders. For example, Pasco from DLR, John Francois, ESA astronaut, Joseph from ESA, director from the ESA Earth Observation, and of course our Shimonetta Di Pippo from the UN USAR and Kai Ube from President from IISL. So those high level people are going to advise for the young people and to take the ideas from their suggestions or recommendations and if possible to integrate for their future implementation. I do hope more young people to attend and more people to engage into space activities in variety of perspectives, like many directions. So we want more young people to go together with and from the session we would like to ignite the passion in young people's heart. So the space activities or industries or agencies, whatever, everything related to space, future will be expanded and more exciting. So I want to contribute as well. Now we want to hear from you. Why do you think ensuring diversity is crucial for a successful future in space? There are just so many challenges that need to be solved uh, within the space industry. Uh, and uh, we need a breadth and depth of different talents, uh, not just to surface the ideas, but also to identify the different problems and different perspectives that need to be addressed. So we need people that have come from all different walks of life, different backgrounds, different uh, fields of experience and expertise who can all come together, feed off each other's ideas and come up with 
new solutions to problems that are emerging today and future problems as well. For inclusivity, we have to include all people, engage all resources. Diversity is extremely important, really in industry, but in any industry, but especially the space industry. Uh, it brings different mindsets to the table, different cultural backgrounds, and we need that in order to inspire future generations and to build future technologies. It depends on more than just one nation, one group of people, one, more than one like-minded uh, set of individuals. It has been said during the Congress that the teams which include women are much more efficient in space exploration. So that would be the first argument. Uh, the second argument is that, of course, women and men, we are 50-50%. So why, why is that not reflected in the space sector? It, sh it shouldn't even be an issue, in my opinion, uh, because we are uh, the two parts of the same coin and we belong with each other. So I think together is better. Venturing into space has always been something to benefit all mankind. So including these different cultures, these different perspectives is very important. So that we can establish something that anyone and everyone can be a part of. And that, I think that's why diversity is just so important. So we can be as inclusive as possible. Exploring uh, the universe is uh, one true uh, enterprise which actually impacts the whole humanity. And uh, I think uh, it is important that we get as many point of view regarding it as possible. And uh, there's immense talent all over the globe and we need to involve everyone to basically uh, to make it a truly universal effort in exploring our beautiful universe. That's it for today, but we'll be back tomorrow with more exclusive material from the 70th International Astronautical Congress.